encourage automation? Because you say that it will liberate people. How? Well, it, <clears throat> there's a few levels to it. First, what has been the greatest source of oppression on this planet since recorded history? Labor. Yeah. And I would say in some sense that's what the political discussion is about. But we, we've, we've skittered off into these radical oversimplifications, which is something like, well, if, if you have more than another person, you're an oppressor. So if we can finally remove that ownership, labor, that old classist duality with the use of automation, that would be profound just on that level. I'm saying scarcity is certainly a fact of reality, but not in even remote proportion the way it used to be. We need to orient our system towards the interest to create an abundance, not towards the interest of preserving scarcity. They say inequality is a problem. It's, yeah, yeah, inequality is a problem. Like it's, it's a terrible problem. But then they say, well, it's probably a function of our political and economic systems and we could fix those. It's like, no. This system perpetuates inequality and larger and larger extensive inequality. You cannot argue that the state alone is the only interference attribute that enables the type of extensive inequality that we see. Because all you have to do is compare different countries to see the difference between those that have very rigid controls, hence state control, not necessarily in the highly coercive way that we see in the U.S. tax system and the like, but still they are limiting the market very directly and regulating it very specifically from the top down, and they have much less violence, they have much less homicide rates, they have much less inequality and all the mental and psychological neuroses that are born of that. It's not a function of our political and economic systems, or if it is, it's at such a deep level that we don't know what drives it, and we certainly don't know how to control it. The most powerful force, the most positive force we do have of the whole of human civilization is since the Industrial Revolution, we're able, we're able to do more and more and more with less and less and less. Buckminster Fuller was a great storyteller and he drew a U shape. This is a canyon, he said. There were people living on each side who needed to communicate and trade, but they couldn't get across. So they tried to figure out what they could do and some of them started to dig up rocks and throw them into the canyon. Eventually the canyon completely filled up with rocks and it became the first bridge. The amazing thing about it was is that it took millions of tons of stone and it took years and years to build and all these tons of stone were used just to hold up a few hundred and fifty pound people carrying something on their back to get across. But it enormously increased wealth because they could trade. But they discovered that there was a problem. There was a stream at the bottom, and the stream water was building up on the back end and causing a problem. So a few brave souls climbed down into the canyon, and they knocked a few stones out at the very bottom, and some of the water could get through. They made a bigger hole, and then a bunch of the rocks collapsed, and the hole disappeared. So they did it again. And they kept doing it until they began to discover that when the hole was a certain shape, it didn't fall back down. When they had discovered the arch, the key to an arch is its shape. An arch is actually not a thing, it's a hole of a certain shape. As they, they learned about what made better arches, what shape was absolutely best for keeping all those stones and, and the people on top of the bridge from falling into the earth, resisting gravity, they learned how to shape the arch in just the right way and the arch kept getting bigger and bigger. They were learning to do more with less. And that is the driving force that can create equitable, equitable distribution and peace on this planet. The title of this talk is Economic Calculation in a Natural Law Resource-Based Economy. And this will be the definitive expression, at least in the condensed form, of the movement, something that's been long overdue. We'll have probably over a thousand footnotes and sources. The problem is that we have a global economic tradition still in place, rooted in 16th century pre-industrial handicraft-oriented thought, that places the act of consuming, buying and selling as the core driver of all social unfolding. The best analogy I can think of is to consider the gas pedal on a car. The more consumption of fuel, the faster it goes, and buying things in our world is the fuel. If you slow down consumption, economic growth slows, people lose jobs, purchasing power declines, and things become destabilized and so forth. And so we're also being driven into this inequality corner by, I would say, by the postmodernists and the neo-Marxists. He's conflating those people with Marxists. You designate your, under quotation marks, I'm not characterizing here, enemy or what you are fighting against as sometimes you call it uh, postmodern neo-Marxism. I know what you mean. 
all this, from political correctness yes. to these excesses of whatever uh, uh, spirit of envy and so on and so on. Do you think they are really, where did you find this data? I don't know them. I would ask you here, give me some names or whatever. Where are the Marxists here? I don't know any. I don't, uh, who, who is a Marxist here? Uh, who does very solid economic work. Well, yeah, I don't totally, uh, David Harvey, one. But he writes very serious books of economic analysis and so on and so on. Then there is the old guy who is far from simplification, Frederick Jameson and so on. But they are totally marginalized today. In this politically correct mainstream, you know, I, I don't see. Well, yeah, your question seemed to me to focus more on the, per the peculiar relationship that I've noticed and that people have disputed between postmodernism and, and neo-Marxism. And I see the connection between the postmodernist types and the Marxists as a sleight of hand that replaced the notion of the oppression of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie as the oppression by one identity group by another. All right. I think Peterson completely exposed himself here. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Because they say this is the pernicious thing. They say, well, the reason that some people have more than others is because every hierarchy is based on arbitrary power and they're all oppressors. The idea that one of the driving forces between history is hierarchical struggle is absolutely true. But the idea that that's actually history is not true because it's deeper than history. It's biology itself because organisms of all sorts organize themselves into hierarchies. And one of the problems with hierarchies is that they tend to arrange themselves into a winner-take-all situation. And here we have the cliché biological determinism of hierarchy, something that has been long criticized by behavioral biologists and anthropologists as an overgeneralization. But before I address this, Peterson then goes on to say that the problem is hence deeper than social organization because hierarchy is inevitable and will prevail regardless. And the truly startling thing about this is that he's completely ignoring everything structural put forward by Marx and others. But you know, this, I envision a world where people are actually able to, to get what they need and it becomes a social reality as opposed to a material and vindictive and status-based reality. It doesn't mean that hierarchy doesn't exist in the future or in an idealized society, because there are other things that we do. I'm not a visual artist, you're a visual artist. I'm a musician. There are natural hierarchies that happen, and we respect those hierarchies because we appreciate the talents of people, not because they're, they have more money than you, therefore you're supposed to glamorize them and look up to them as though they're better than you. That is a complete contrivance. The criticism of hierarchy is not the criticism of hierarchy in and of itself in whatever form it may take. It is the criticism of hierarchy that is mechanistically output by the very structure of market capitalism. It's about the dynamics that occur between those with capital and those without, labor and owners, and hence the class relationships and economic quality of life relationships that result consequentially because of the structure. So there's always gonna be a natural hierarchy which is good because that proves our group mind, it proves our collaborative sense that you can do things that I can't do, and so on and so forth. That's what motivates the collaborative sense and the power of our society as a civilization. And if we can bring those form, that formula together, we could get everything back on track. As far as biologically determined hierarchy in human society, it's an extremely broad idea, which could be talked about later if need be, but that's not what Marx is talking about. Not to mention, there's no vagueness here. Just look around you at what people are complaining about today. Massive inequality between people with immense amounts of growing capital and then a working class with stagnating wages and all the general cost efficiency oppressive forces that are inherent to the logic of the system. See, this is part of what seems to drive inequality is that as you get successful, the opportunities that come your way start to multiply and they don't multiply linearly, they multiply exponentially. And so when you start moving up, you start moving up faster and faster and faster and faster. And then you'll hit a point where you have so many opportunities that you don't even know what to do with them. We always find as we investigate the universe, make the microscope bigger and bigger and bigger, and we will find ever more minute things. And so it's a nonlinear improvement, but the the, the downside of that is, and you might have had periods in your life where 
that were like this too, where let's say you start to get depressed and then you start to drink because you're depressed. And then you start to isolate yourself because you're drinking and you're depressed. Make the telescope bigger and bigger and bigger and the universe expands because it's running away from itself. And because you're drunk and depressed, then your friends start to abandon you and then you lose your job. It won't do that if you don't chase it. <laughs> it's like you're not going downhill in a straight line. You're going downhill faster and faster and faster till you fall off a cliff. And that seems to be how the world works. It's like there's a center point. It's unstable. Things improve, then they improve exponentially. And things fall, and then they fall off exponentially. And that seems to be what's driving inequality. So I hope it is clear that the system simply does not reward or even support environmental sustainability in the form of conservation. Instead, it, re it rewards servicing, turnover and waste. The more problems and inefficiencies we have, not to mention the more insecure, materialistic and needy the population becomes. You start to succeed and the probability that you'll continue to succeed starts to expand. Mm. Like, so, but does that not mean, Jordan, that would you then reject any attempt to alter mm. systems in favor of fairness? And here's another thing I'll, I'll mention. All the money that's made in the world comes from the lower class taking loans. So right now, that less than 63% of Americans have $1,000 in savings. Yet the lower class, that same subclass, is what takes on all the major loans, home loans, car loans. That money comes in, the people buy all this stuff, and then that money that's spent goes basically right back up to the upper class again because we, as we know through the growth of the past 10 years, all of the, the major income has gone to the upper 10, well, five to 10%. So it's even worse now. So you see my point? Because it, it seems to me that the focus is on like, and as it would be for a clinical psychologist, mm -hmm. individual change. Now, part of my personal experience is without individual change, social change is sort of irrelevant. And many well, okay, great gurus but, but would you say- answered, You answered it right then and there. It's yes, like the huge wealth gap we see today is reminiscent of all the wealth gaps in history because of different levels of advantage that are achieved by a corporation or a political institution. Of course, we all know corporations and political institutions are one today. So it's, you think that the politics is happening at a lower level, the phenomenology that's, uh, where the dis where the, that's significant is, ha is, ha is a bigger tide? We so we're, the people take on all the loans of the entire collective money in society, and then that money is extracted through them through various forms of structural classism and goes right back up to the upper 1%. People should be enraged by that. But they don't see it because it's a structural phenomenon. It's something that's happening under the surface that isn't readily apparent. And that's why, due to ignorance, no one really reacts on it. And within it, political systems are absolutely. just flowing about. Oh, but that doesn't absolutely. mean we should dismantle the ones we have in search of fairer, more just, better well, ones, if particularly could, if they're empirically not working. And they always really have been. If you go back to kings, the kings usually ran the ships, they got everything back, and then they would distribute it to their, to their traders and everything else, the kings and everything in feudalism. Mercantilism was very similar, and then we ended up with capitalism. So in... This thing called the non-aggression principle, and what frustrates me again is that everything you speak of I agree with within the principles that you advocate. See, I don't agree with the, that the idea of the market, as you, as you conceive of it, is, is just that, a system of voluntary exchange with non-coercion and people just follow this basic ethical guideline, that everything's going to be fine. I look at it from its root source and course of human evolution and, and using history as a guide. I look at the root psychology of what it means to have this concept that's preve pre prevailing in society where you're supposed to be put on a pedestal for gaining while others suffer. This psychology and value system disorder is ever pervasive and it really does define the state. And I can't deny- well, okay. If you and I exchange something voluntarily, by definition, we are both better off because of that exchange, right? So the old example is if I have a dollar and you have a pencil and we voluntarily exchange those two items, then by definition, in praxeologically, in reality, foundationally, rationally, empirically, I must want the pencil more than I want my dollar, and you must want my dollar more than you want your pencil, because we're freely exchanging those things. So in a free market exchange, two, the two parties who voluntarily exchange are by definition better off. Uh, they have, and, and this is true if I decide to go and work for someone rather than start my own company. Voluntarism. Action, def action based on non-coercion is probably the best definition, right? Voluntarism? Mm -hmm. Okay. There are two basic broad 
presuppositions, if you will, inherent to this common concept, and especially in economic use. The first is a little bit difficult to describe because it's, it's, it's hard for people to relate to it at all, but I'm going to give it a shot. The first is this distorted implication of free will. Most people are, are powerfully, their intuitions are powerfully shaped by the, the illusion, the sense that they have the freedom to consciously author their thoughts and actions. So people feel that there is a compelling subjective mystery and they don't, that no one has been able to give an argument about how it would map onto to physical reality, but people feel that the, 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 the experience is so compelling that there's just no reason to, to worry about it. This is the state from which we need to live. As though any action we manifest exists in a vacuum, absent the ever-pervasive conscious and subconscious social and psychological pressures we endure on a daily basis. Then there are people like Dan who uh, have a different, from my view, essentially change the subject. I mean, the, the, the disagreement between Dan and myself is essentially this. It's like we're living in a world where most people believe in Atlantis and they believe in the underwater kingdom and, and you know, they, they, they read Plato closely trying to figure out where it was and, and um, I want to say Atlantis doesn't exist, it didn't exist, people are confused about Atlantis. Well, uh, in my own work um, I find that in spite of all my labors for many years there's a lot of scientists that still are just tone deaf and, and obtuse about free will. They take most simple-minded definition of free will that's out there and discover that that kind of free will is an illusion. Well, yeah, we've known that for you know more than 100 years. Uh, but that's not what the issue is. If they think that's the issue, then, then they should go back to school. Uh, Dan wants to say is that Atlantis is really Sicily. And he'll give a whole argument about why Sicily answers to many of the claims that people are making about Atlantis. And I want to say, no, but, but they're still talking about being underwater. Now, Sicily <laughs> doesn't do that. And he says, but Sicily is a great place, and there's reasons to visit, and let's talk about Sicily. <laughs> We're the only ones that have free will. It's something that evolved. It's morally important. That's why free will is important, because we want to be, and should want to be, morally competent agents, agents who can take responsibility for their actions. That's the heart of free will. And when he and I argue about this, he begins to respond to me as though I'm saying Sicily doesn't exist. And that's what, so there's a, there's a fair amount of talking past one another in, in these kinds of debates. Logical levels. Information sorted according to category and level of detail. have found that generalizing and going into detail are different processes. Discover inconsistent logical levels. Choose level of detail.
What difference could it make to be more aware of logical levels? Uh, of course Sicily exists, but the people who are talking about underwater, an underwater kingdom are at the very least confused. And, that, and that's the situation we're in with free will. I mean, you and I are part of a community and you know, a, a pretty visible part of a community that prides itself on being willing to change its opinions and views more or less in real time under pressure from better arguments and better data. And I think I said in my article in, re in response to your review of my book, Free Will, that, that this is a very rare occurrence. I mean, to see someone relinquish his cherished opinion more or less on the spot under pressure from a, an interlocutor, that's about as rare as seeing a supernova overhead, and it really shouldn't be, I mean, because there's, there's nothing that tokens intellectual honesty more than a willingness to step away from one's views once they are shown to be an error. And I'm not saying we're necessarily going to get there in this conversation about free will, but there was something that went awry in our exchange, in our written exchanges, you know, tonally, and neither of us felt good about the result. And, and so, again, we're, you know, we'll talk about free will as well, but this, I, I think this conversation is proceeding along two levels where there's the thing we're talking about philosophically, which is free will, but then there's just the, the way in which I want us to both be sensitive to getting hijacked into unproductive lines that make it, make it needlessly hard to talk about. Um, thanks, Sam. This is a beautiful setting. If we can't agree on some things here, we shouldn't be in this business. That's right. The main point of my essay was, yes, you, you have misconstrued my brand of compatibilism. I, I am, needless to say, very uncomfortable with the idea that I have misrepresented your view. And if I did that in my book, I certainly want to correct that here. So, As I see it, there are two completely intention themes out there about what free will is. One is that it's incompatible with determinism, and the other is that it's the basis of moral responsibility. I think it's the second one that's the important one. That's the variety of free will worth wanting. And I think the other one's a throwaway. And I agree with you. Indeterminist free will, libertarian free will, is a f philosopher's fantasy. It's, it is not worth it, it is just, it's just, a fantasy. There is a clear and present fallacy that engagement at all in the market system is voluntary, as though we are all just equal in our reductionist existence as voluntary exchangers. This just might be the most absurd concept of all when it comes to this type of worldview. Uh, so we agree on so much. We have no uh, love for uh, libertarian uh, indeterminism, for agent causation for all of that metaphysical gobbledygook? There, I, I do an analysis in the book that just looks at, it looks at all the basic renewables and each one of them has the capacity to create a global abundance and meet the current needs. And you put them all together in a synergy and then make, make basic what's called mixed use systems. It's a little bit technical, but we don't have any kind of systemic incorporation in our cities, not like they should be. Every single, everything in the house today should have solar panels that not only power the home as much as possible, but they run the energy back out into a central grid. Suddenly everything becomes an attribute of energy development. It's shared. And you do that if someone created a society that there's a few smaller cities in, cities, cities in Europe that are doing that with outrageous efficiency potential. We're both good naturalists mm -hmm. and we both agree that the truths of neuroscience and the truths of physics, physics doesn't have much to do with it actually, are compatible with most of our understanding, our everyday understanding of responsibility, taking responsibility, uh, being morally responsible enough to be held to our word. So when you put all that together, uh, there's, it, it's absurd, it's absurd. You know, everyone in small pockets and these entrepreneurs are doing their best, you know, even uh, like Elon Musk and the battery technology, and they're trying to do something, but there's no concentrated focus. There needs to be a basically a Manhattan project to figure out what the best solution is globally to unify the synergies of all of our renewables and to make them all work. 
And if we did that, if we actually got the minds of, say, all the universities together right now, and you had a university project across the entire world and said, we're going to focus on this problem right now. What is the combination of renewables? How do we distribute it across the world? And how do we make it uh, create a, an abundance at zero cost effectively? And I guarantee if you did that, it would happen probably in six months. So uh, I, I certainly agree with most of that. I think there's some interesting points of disagreement on the moral responsibility issue, which, which we should talk about. Well, um, my view of compatibilism is pretty much what I just said, and you were nodding. And you were not considering that a serious view about free will. There are two different ways of dealing with the same issue. Does free will really exist? Well, if, if free will means what Dennett says it means, yes. And you agree. If it means what some people think, then the answer is no. Yeah, I, I understand that, but I would put to you the question, there is a difference between explaining something and changing the subject. So this is my gripe about compatibilism, and this is, this is something we'll get into. So I, but I, I, I assume you will admit there, that there is a difference between purifying a real phenomenon of its folk psychological baggage, which I think this is what you think compatibilism is doing, and actually failing to interact with some core features that are just ineliminable from the concept itself. Let me surprise you by saying, I don't think there's a sharp line between those two. And I think that's quite obvious, that whether I'm changing the subject, I mean, I'm so used to that retort about any line along right. this. So, no, I think that's, that's just a debater's point. We should just set that aside. Saying you're just changing the subject is a way of as we're declaring a whole manifold, a whole variety spectrum of clarificatory views, which you're not accepting because you're clinging to some core part of what free will is. You want to claim that free will, the core of free will, is its, is its denial of determinism. And I've made a career saying that's not the core. And I've made a career, made a career, made a career saying, saying that's not the core. Is that when people think about freedom in the context of free will, they're ignoring a very good and legitimate notion of freedom, which is basically the engineering notion of freedom when you talk about degrees of freedom. Humans have a limited capacity to control their own behavior. It's a fact. My arms, you know, my wrist and my shoulder, my elbow, those joints, that there's, th there's th three degrees of freedom right there. And in control theory, it's all about how you control the degrees of freedom. We exist in a continuum of social influences that are invariably subject to the behavioral propensities and reactions of the culture we inhabit. And if we look around the world, we can see that some things have basically no degrees of freedom, that rock over there, and some things, like you and me, have uncountably many degrees of freedom. What removes freedom from somebody is if either the degrees of freedom don't exist, they're blocked mechanically, or some other agent has usurped them and has taken over control. The market system's structural imposition for survival itself, in my view, unnecessarily given the state of technology and our capacity to create an abundance, coerces all human beings to submit to labor for income. A marionette and a puppeteer. We can distinguish free agents from unfree agents in a deterministic world or in an indeterministic world. Determinism and indeterminism make no difference to that categorization, and it's that categorization which makes the moral difference. Well, libertarians believe that no person should initiate force against another person, or libertarians believe in a right of self-ownership, or libertarians are against any form of aggression. Regardless of how you state the basic libertarian principle, somewhere in that statement, you're going to have an ought statement, a should statement, or a statement pertaining to rights, and of course rights have implicit within them ought statements. In other words, you'll have to say something like, people ought not to aggress. So in the very statement of the essence of libertarianism, you are already hip deep in ethics. How is voluntary trade coercive? That just seems to me like saying lovemaking is rape. It just seems like you're just jamming two opposite things together and because, calling them the same. Because the act of trade itself is coercive. 
And so there's a, there's a first-person description of this problem, and there's a third-person description of this problem. And I think if we bounce between the two without knowing that we're bouncing between the two, we are, are losing sight of, of important details. So people feel that they have libertarian free will. I'm not saying that the... And how is the act of trade coercive? Because people have to trade in this system to survive unnecessarily. And when I, when I get emails from people who are psychologically destabilized by my argument that free will doesn't exist, these are people who feel like something integral to their psychological life and well-being is being put in jeopardy. They have to do something. They don't have to trade. They have to do... Well, they, how do they have to trade? They have to either... Tr I, and I can say this from, from both sides because I know what it's like for, to feel that, that I could have done otherwise. Trade they can go, labor. they can go, and, they and I mean, 98% of the world's surface is uninhabited. They can go and live in oh. the woods and they can grow their own food oh, and they true. can hunt their own animals. I don't understand how it is they have to trade. Uh, I mean, people don't right. have to trade. I you think that the point right. that I'm making is it's to their advantage to trade. Oh. I think people find that the division of labor, like I fish and you grow wheat and we, we trade or whatever, the division of labor and all of that is economically productive that people specialize in doing things and then trade the results of that labor so we don't all have to become good at everything. I think people find it advantageous to trade, but saying how that somehow forces them to trade, uh, I think is not clear to me. The United States empire, it doesn't, it's not susceptible to any of this because it's just, the, it's just the bully in the room, it's the big empire, and it has its vassal states that help, and it has its arm of NATO, and it has its all its World Bank IMF institutions to support its economic worldview, which eventually leads to its territorial and geopolitical control of other nations, because that force won't tolerate anything else. So yeah, it's, it's really insidious, and we've had now an empire that's built really on economic coercion more than anything else. And I mean, the, the military bases are still powerful. They're there and they're, they're clearly functional. But the economic power yielded in the ideology of neoliberalism has been the true driving force of control. Libertarian free will is this, is anchored to this notion of, I could have done otherwise. So if, if we rewound the universe to precisely as it was a few moments ago, I could complete this sentence, this sentence differently than I did. You know, whether you throw indeterminism or determinism or, or some combination thereof, there is no scientific rationale for that claim. If you, re if you rewound the universe to precisely its prior state. In the context of market economics, in the context of trade, in the context of everything that you speak of, but they use the arm of the state to their advantage for their elitist purposes. Do I think that's right? Absolutely not. I would love, Stefan, to see the type of market that you talk about. The problem is it's impossible. There will always be a gravitation towards these power consolidations. But Peter, come on, just saying that something is, poss is impossible doesn't make it so. But when you say the market creates the state, what you would then, I think, seem to be arguing was that at some point in the past, there existed uh, a, a free market, which then created a state where no state existed before. And it would seem to me, based on my understanding of history, that governments have been the dominating uh, factor throughout history. And they can be sort of local tribal governments like the warlords and the Genghis Khans. And, but that's because there's a state uh, in a free market. It would not be possible to do that in a, like an, an anarchic, no state free, free what I market. Find, what I find and of course, there are many people in the world that still look at this causality in reverse. In some economic views, state government is deemed the central problem as opposed to the self-interest and competitive advantage seeking ethos inherent to market capitalism. Interesting about that argument is that you're basically admitting that that propensity is there. As the argument goes, if state power was removed or reduced dramatically, the market and society would be free of most of its negative effects. Basically saying that it's a natural... If there's a state, yes. It's a natural propensity for this type of interest and power. So if there isn't a state, it wouldn't happen. That's, that's interesting. I don't know if I agree with that because if the interest is there to create some type of power consolidation to maintain differential advantage, to override the interests of other producers, to secure wealth and market share for a particular group, that could manifest in all sorts of other ways. I mean, I look at the state as just one example of how this power consolidation tendency materializes. The problem with this argument is that it forgets that capitalism is just a variation of a scarcity-driven specialization and property-based exchange system, a system which actually goes back millennia in one form or another. Early settlements naturally needed to protect themselves as resource and land acquisition moved forward over time. Armies were created to protect resources from invading forces and the like. 
At the same time, people were working to engage, ag engage agriculture and handicraft, and it revealed labor and exchange value in, the form, in a very primitive form. Hence, property value in the midst of this scarcity demanded regulation and laws, not only to protect property, but to protect commerce and also avoid scams and fraud in transactions. This is the seed of the state. The market is a game and people can cheat. You need regulation. This is the basic problem. The market also allows, and here's the punchline, that regulation to be purchased by money. Therefore, there is no guaranteed integrity. The state and the market both battle each other and complement each other. You will always have regulatory power centers in a market economy. The state and the market are inseparable. They go hand in hand. Because I think the problem is deeper than that. I, I don't think the fundamental problem is that people don't have enough money. I think the fundamental problem is that human beings in some sense are beasts of burden. And if they're not given if they're not provided with a place where they can accept social responsibility, social and individual responsibility in an honorable manner, they degenerate and die. Now, as an aside, people often challenge this reality with moral or ethical arguments, which I'm sorry to say are entirely culturally subjective. In a world where everything is for sale, where the re reward reinforcement, the operant condition, is directly tied to seeking personal advantage and gain, who is to say where the lines should be drawn in that process? This is why moral principles without structural reinforcement are useless. In the end, the question isn't what is morally right or what is morally wrong. The question is what works and what doesn't. And sometimes it takes a great deal of time for the truth of such patterns to materialize. Let me give you the example that I like to use from the 19th century. Uh, libertarians were very involved, as you may know, in the pre-Civil War era with the abolition of slavery. They were at the cutting edge, so to speak, of the abolitionist movement. Individuals like William Lloyd Garrison, Lysander Spooner, Wendell Phillips, and others. Now, their argument was explicitly libertarian. They explicitly argued on the basis of self-ownership. Throughout the abolitionist literature are constant references to self-ownership as the moral objection to slavery. They accused slave owners as being, as they put it, man-stealers because they deprived the slave of that which was properly his own, namely his body, his freedom. Now, there developed a very important split in the abolitionist, or not in the abolitionist movement, but in the anti-slavery movement generally. The abolitionists were in favor of, the immediate end, of an immediate end to slavery, by which they meant as fast as is humanly possible. They argued that there should be no other considerations which override the slave's right to his own life and freedom. For example, most people, rightly so, see abject human slavery historically as a morally wrong condition. But let's dig deeper into the characteristics and think more deeply. I think it is much more productive to recognize that slavery didn't work in the sense that it was culturally unsustainable. Bigotry in all forms is not just ugly, it is culturally unsustainable because it generates conflict. There was another group uh, which became known as the gradualists who argued, who agreed with the abolitionists. They said, well, it's true that slavery is wrong, it's evil, it should be gotten rid of, but they added on eventually. What they argued was that should slavery cease immediately, it would wreak economic havoc on the South in particular, but also on the Northern industrial states which relied very heavily on Southern agriculture. So what they did was introduce an argument, an economic argument, trying to show that the immediate abolition of slavery would wreak economic havoc, and therefore slavery had to be phased out in increments rather than immediately. This was a very important and bitterly fought contest between the two sides. Now, it's important to note how the abolitionists responded to this. They did not necessarily try to argue that the immediate abol abolition of slavery would not have these terrible economic consequences, what they argued was that this economic sort of argument was irrelevant because what had to take precedence was the right of the slave to his own liberty. And this was the important argument. Now here it seems to me is a very, very clear example that can arise and has arisen in many lesser forms, a very clear example of a conflict between a moral and an economic argument. And the abolitionists recognized clearly that the moral argument was the real basis for their philosophy and therefore that had to be the guiding principle as indeed I think it has to be the guiding principle for libertarians today. 
I'm not aware of any slave-owning society that did not undergo large slave rebellions. Those resources need to be funneled down to the people who have zero so that they have an opportunity to at least get to the point where they can innovate and so the bloody, whole bloody thing doesn't wobble and fall. The first problem with competition in a market system where everyone's competing for market share, meaning money, the competition becomes, the innovation that's produced is artificial. It, they're not trying to improve on something to meet a human need, they're trying to improve on something to sell. A healthy uh, uh, industrial system isn't trying to artificially create demand once again. It's there to meet demand. In fact, you don't want to artificially create demand because that means you're going to be reducing your sustainability. You want a minimalistic culture. You don't want what advertising is driving now. So that's an aside of what you're asking, but I think it's a very important point that people miss when they talk about innovation uh, through competition especially. So it's unstable and again, therefore unsustainable. Right, because the lefties say, uh-oh, oh, too much inequality. And they need to be listened to because the evidence is quite clear. If you let the inequality ramp up enough, the whole system destabilizes because the people at the bottom think, fuck it, we'll just, we'll just flip the system upside down. Right. So competition has been proven in many academic journals to be hideously hindering and neur neuroses producing. There's little evidence to say that the competitive industry of, of capitalism actually innovates in a way that's somehow superior to a collaborative system, especially if people have the same intent. So you can imagine, you know, anyone can sit and imagine the building of something, once again, in like an open source collaborative commons, and they know what they want. They can, they can infer what the next stage would be. It doesn't take this sort of imposition built on the comp, com, competitive coercion, effectively, to impose the demand upon them. So if we know what we want and we can infer the next stage of things, why do we need companies competing against each other? We can just, now we have the technology to work together. And again, it's, it would be that much more innovative if we did that. No one wants that. And market capitalism is on the same path. There are more slaves in the world today operating within the bounds of the market economy than any time in human history. Class warfare. This leads us well into the subject of class warfare and socioeconomic inequality. The long history of so-called socialist outcry has largely been about this constant and inhumane imbalance on one level or another. A great deal of time has been spent by many critics of capitalism describing how it is indeed a system of exploitation, which inherently separates a society into stratified economic layers with a higher class given dominance over the lower structurally. It's structurally built right in. And if you're one of those people that doesn't agree with this reality, Ask yourself why there has been one labor strike after another in the past 300 years, why worker unions even exist, why CEOs often tend to make hundreds of times more money than the common worker, or why 46% of the world's wealth is now owned by 1%, which are almost exclusively of what we could call the capitalist ownership class. Inequality and class separation is a direct mathematical result of the market's inherently competitive orientation which divides individuals in small groups as they work to compete against each other for survival and security. It is entirely individualistically oriented, driven by a core incentive system based around isolated self-preservation, assuming the need to constantly reinforce one's security financially, since the market climate, the environment gives no certainty whatsoever of well-being in and of itself. Fear and greed. <laughs> The rich get richer because the model favors them and the poor basically stay the same because the system works against them by comparison. It is structurally classed. Those with more money have more options and influence than those with less. You are only as free as they say as your purchasing power will allow you to be. And the credit system is a perfect example. Money is treated as nothing more than a product in the, in the credit system, in the banking system. Money is sold by banks via loans for profit, which comes in the form of interest. If you miss payments or violate your contract, often the interest rate does what? It goes up because you are now considered a higher risk consumer. If you fail to meet that interest or future payments, you might default on the loan. You punish, your punishment, excuse me, is the ruining of your credit rating or reputation in the financial circles. And once that happens, your financial flexibility is even more stifled as your economic access is limited. That's the opiate crisis in mm. the West right now. Like men need, men who, who are men don't need money. They need function. 
this, people see this as just the way things are, but they don't realize how insidious this is. This compounds the lower classes to stay low for reasons and forces of coercion that are built, built into the structure that are beyond their control.